Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Cardiff Garcia. Cardiff is the U.S. editor of the immensely popular Financial Times blog, Alphaville. There he leads a crack team of writers who cover everything from the U.S. monetary policy to China's capital flows to Bitcoin to the Eurozone crisis. He is also the co-host of the FT podcast series Alpha Chat and Alpha Chatterbox. Cardiff formerly worked for J.P. Morgan and Dow Jones Financial Newswire. And last but not least, he's something of a mixed martial art expert, which ironically can be very useful in explaining monetary policy. So welcome to the show, Cardiff. Thanks. Uh, various parts of that introduction were maybe too generous, uh, but I appreciate it. I won't even correct you. <laughs> okay. <can> just ahead. <laughs> we'll come back to the mixed martial art part a little okay. bit later. Um, but uh, first... Tell us how you got into journalism, into macro blogging. Okay. Um, what was your journey? Yeah, it was a bit of a circuitous path, uh, as I think many journalists have um, in their backgrounds. Uh, I think the first inkling that I thought I might want to be a journalist actually happened while I was still at J.P. Morgan. Uh, I was working for the private bank. We were covering high net worth clients uh, in Latin America, and specifically Mexico, Southern Cone. I didn't really like our clients very much. I didn't like that part of the business. Uh, but I did like covering markets. And while I was there, I ran uh, a proprietary newsletter for other analysts uh, in my okay. final year. And I thought, God, this, this reading and writing thing seems like a lot of fun. I should be doing more of that. Uh, went to journalism school. I am somewhat uh, ashamed to admit. Um, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, and after that, uh, I went traveling for about a year, uh, partly to get out of New York for a little while and partly to freelance a bit. Um, so the project that I had in mind when I left was to do um, a story about Muay Thai fighters in Bangkok. Muay Thai is a martial art I do in mm -hmm. New York. And I thought, great, I'll go uh, to a gym in Bangkok. I'll train alongside these guys, see what it's like. I won't fight or anything. I'm just a recreational guy. Okay. Um, and, uh, and I'll do a story about it, and I'll come back in three months. I ended up actually being gone for more than a year because I just threw my stuff in storage and I backpacked around until I was finally broke. I'd finally spent all of my <laughs> banking money and and then I had to get serious about being a journalist. Um, so when I got back, I spent some time freelancing for a little while. Um, because I had the finance background, I found it easier and a little bit more natural mm -hmm. to just get a job uh, writing about finance and economics. But the truth was that I was a bit out of shape, right? Like my mind was out of shape. Okay. It had been a while since I had uh, really delved deeply into what was happening. And of course, that was 2007 when mm. so many exciting things were, were starting yep. to happen. Um, so I freelanced for a bit. I finally got a job as a reporter uh, for Dow Jones uh, and specifically for uh, a newspaper based in London called Financial News uh, that covers financial institutions. And I was actually writing for them out of their New York bureau uh, throughout the early stages of the crisis crisis, essentially. Um, but while I was there, uh, I recognized how amazing uh, the coverage on blogs was. And I was stunned that in a couple of cases, um, the blogosphere was writing about topics that would only later enter mm. mainstream conversations and conversations among policymakers. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, the one that always springs to mind um, was the argument about whether or not uh, the government should eventually nationalize the banks as part that. of their bailouts. You know? yep. Um, yep. And it was astonishing to me that uh, in 2008, this was a conversation that was being had throughout the blogosphere. Um, and it was so interesting and so conversational and interactive. Uh, and only later, only, you know, uh, I think in the early months of 2009, when things really started to get bad, uh, that this conversation was being had seriously, in other words, by policymakers. I mean, you'd sort of heard, you know, little yep. bits and bops here and there. But in the blogosphere, you could get such a rich understanding uh, of the issue. Um, and I thought that was something where... Uh, you know, if I'm going to be a finance or an economics writer, that's where I should be. That was exciting to me. Um, so I just started blogging later on at CardiffGarcia.com, right? Nobody was really paying attention. But eventually, uh, some of my posts were spotted uh, by a blogger named Felix Salmon, who's a very well-known yes. finance and economics writer mm -hmm. now. And uh, fortuitously, a year later, while I was still, um, while I was still at Financial News, uh, and then I left uh, to freelance for a while, 
Um, in those early stages of 2010, Alphaville started looking for a writer, uh, and Felix uh, and Heidi Moore, who I used to work for, and a couple of other people recommended me to Paul Murphy, who was the editor and founder of Alphaville. Paul and I had a beer. That was my interview. <laughs> uh, and in the middle of 2010, I was hired uh, by Alphaville, and I've been there since. I mean, we've done a lot of things, and Alphaville itself yep. has changed a lot since. Uh, but that is more or less the path I took okay. to, to FD Alphaville. Now you're the editor on the American side or the U.S. side. So I am the U.S. editor uh, of FT Alphaville, okay. um, but that doesn't involve what it sounds like it involves, right? Uh, the editor title was just kind of a recognition that I'd been there for a little while, okay. um, and also a recognition that I wanted to try some other things besides just blogging, right? Um, the podcast, obviously, is one mm. thing. Um, helping out a lot with planning events was another thing because I, I think that's kind of been a natural evolution for a lot of journalistic organizations that are looking to do other things. Um, so we've had a couple of pub quizzes uh, in New York. Um, the team has put together, uh, and this is mostly being led out of London, um, two Camp Alphavilles in London, and we want to do a Camp Alphaville in New York this year, uh, which is essentially a macroeconomics and finance festival of sorts, right? So something where you uh, combine the usual dense uh, conversations and wonkiness, but you make it a little bit of fun for the people who go there. So I wouldn't read too much into the editorship title. It doesn't mean okay. I'm like the grand poobah of anything. It right. just means that I have a multifaceted set of right. duties, uh, which are all a lot of fun uh, and that sort of have branched out from just writing. Okay. And you're still a contributor too. I mean, I've been following your work. Um, I didn't realize it's 2010, but 2010 is when you, you got there. Yep. So what is it like in, in the day of a life of a blogger at, at FT Alphaville? Do you guys, are you in the office together? Are you, you, you shoot the bull together? Do you talk shop? I mean, what, what happens? Yeah, I mean, it's, we're spaced out throughout the world, by the way. So there's a couple of us in New York, Matt mm -hmm. Klein and me. There's a few of us in London. Um, for a while, my colleague Izzy Kaminska was in Geneva. She's now in London. Uh, David Cowhan uh, is in Mumbai. Um, wow. Yeah, and, and before we've had people in Tokyo and in Australia, we keep in touch through a Slack conversation, and it's just a running thing. You don't have to respond every time somebody addresses okay. you. If you're off writing or doing something else, that's cool. Um, but we trade a lot of ideas there. Uh, there are no kind of house opinions, right? Everybody's allowed to you know, disagree, including you know, formally when we write, and we do that sometimes. Um, so we bounce ideas off each other, uh, but the entire, uh, the entire philosophy that Alphaville has always embraced, and I certainly hope will always embrace, um, is that every writer is allowed to gravitate towards those topics that really fascinate him mm -hmm. or her, uh, that really interest him, and then you just write the hell out of it, right? There are no quotas. You don't have to write a certain you know amount of posts each day. Um, you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to. I don't know. Hit a word count. There are no word limits. Things like well, that. So the, the formal restrictions don't exist there. Right. We can do whatever we want. But the trade-off is you have to come up with your own ideas. There's very little handholding, uh, and you're expected to do good work, interesting work, and and stuff that tries to kind of push the envelope of what's there. Okay, I was going to ask this later, but since we're on this topic, what if there's a young, aspiring blogger, writer, journalist out there who wants to go down the path you'd have and end up at an FT Alphaville type setting? What would you recommend they do at this point in their life? I, I, I guess I would start by just challenging the premise of the question, right? Okay. In other words, it's not necessarily a good idea, especially in journalism, to start out by thinking, I want this job, this kind okay. of job at this kind of place, right? I saw this about a decade ago, especially when I was in journalism school. A lot of people saying, I want to one day write for The New Yorker, or I want to mm. one day write for The Economist, things like that. That is probably a bad idea, partly because journalism changes so quickly. Um, Instead, focus on the kinds of tasks you like doing or that you think you might like doing. If you love writing about economics, then by all means, throw yourself into it and start writing about economics. Don't worry about the place where you're going to do it or the format, right? Mm -hmm. Just find a way to do it the way you like to do it. Um, same thing with, you know, all the other things that we do now. You know, before you and I were just writers, we were just blogging. Now we're both podcasting, right? Mm -hmm. These kinds of things are always going to happen, especially in journalism where the business model hasn't really worked itself out yet. Nobody's really found it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess the two pieces of advice are don't worry too much about the specific kind of place because the kind of place that you think matters now might not even exist in 10 years. Worry more yep. about the uh, worry more about the platform. And the second thing is uh, do what uh, Scott Adams recommends. So Scott Adams is the uh, the um, 
Dilbert comic, right? Right. And uh, I read his uh, his recent self help book not okay. long ago. Okay. He. Um, I sometimes read self help books not because I think that I'm going to find anything especially useful there, but because <laughs> they make me feel better about myself. Like they get me motivated and excited. Uh-huh. Like they, it's sort of therapeutic, and I sort of sure, I sure. ignore what's actually inside them most of the time. His book was an exception because, uh, in part, it's based on behavioral research and some other things. His uh, recommendation uh, is that you should build uh, a talent stack, right? So don't worry about being the best at any one thing. Try to find a bunch of different things that you could be good at and then find a way to combine all of those uh, Hmm. into an interesting package. That's what's going to make yourself useful. Um, So uh, to uh, sort of apply that to myself, right? Um, I'm not an economist. I don't have formal economic training except for 101, right, when I was in college. Um, And I couldn't read, you know, uh, any kind of an econometric paper, right? I wouldn't be able to understand it. Uh, But I know some about it. I know some things about economics. I know which economists to turn to for certain things. And Mm -hmm. I try to, over time, learn how to spot different patterns that are useful and interesting uh, in the real world, right? I'm not the most uh, articulate person in the world, uh, but I speak okay. And I try to get better and better over time uh, at having presence and being able to speak in public, right? Mm -hmm. These things come with time as well. Uh, And then, you know, I'm not going to win a Pulitzer Prize in, in any kind of um, in any kind of writing genre, okay? But little by little, you start getting better at turning, uh, you know, one coherent phrase after another. Uh, and then over time, like you put that together, and it's a package of uh, of skills and talents and things you've developed that are uh, interesting to a company. And that to me seems like the best approach. Uh, in general, for life, right? Not just right. in journalism and not just specific to what I do, but you know, in general. Well, I look forward to your book on uh, living a good <laughs> life. So, <laughs> no, that, that's useful because I know there are people out there who uh, reached out to me before who you know, people want to know what should I do, what path should I go? And, and you know, I'm not a journalist, but um, that, that's great advice. All right, let's switch gears and, and talk about the, the economy, actually, because you, you do know a lot. You said you want one on all you had, but you know a lot more than that. Um, anyone who's read your work knows that you have a, a good command of some very technical issues. Um, and I want to talk about the crisis, and I, I want to ask you, as a journalist, mm-hmm. um, was it disappointing during the crisis and, and afterwards to see all the disagreement among economists? There are some pretty intense fights. So Paul Krugman versus John Cochran, Mark Toma versus Stephen Williamson. There, right. Uh, John I'll, Taylor versus everybody. <laughs> yes. Mark Monitors, myself, versus MMTers. I mean, right. I mean, w- w- I guess two questions. Was it disappointing or was it enlightening? Did, did we learn anything from these exchanges? Are we any better because we had these debates? I think so. Um, was it disappointing? Uh, no, because I didn't know enough beforehand to be disappointed. Okay. It was intellectually interesting and it was maybe a little bit frustrating to see because if you're coming to this material uh, anew, as a lot of people were, people mm-hmm. who haven't studied uh, economics formally, uh, they might think, well, God, these people don't know anything. If all the biggest names seem to disagree right. about how to react to the single most salient economic event of our lifetimes, uh, what have they been doing all this time? <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. um, So that was interesting. But are we, uh, are we better off for having had the debates? I do think so. Uh, my own kind of narrative about economists in the crisis is that they've been stumbling towards accuracy, right? Okay. Um, they probably all would have preferred to have leapt towards accuracy or glided towards sure. it or gotten there uh, smoothly. But um, I think all of these debates are necessary. Uh, and in having the debates, you also find out where the points of friction are. Right? And once you've identified those, you can see exactly how relevant they are. And you can also see if they really are points of friction. Um, probably the best example I can give uh, was the really shockingly contentious debate over how to fill uh, a demand shortfall. Right? Uh, so the monetarists right, uh, mostly said the central bank can do this if it's committed enough. Right? Mm-hmm. It has the power. And in fact, the fiscal guys can't do it unless the central bank is on board because there will be the monetary offset, right? Yep. They won't get there. Um, you need the expectation of what's going to happen later and how uh, the central bank is going to react to certain economic events uh, in order to guide the recovery back to a stronger footing, right? Uh, the fiscalists essentially said, well, listen, we lowered interest rates to zero and it's game over, right? Now we need mm-hmm. uh, to crank up the fiscal mechanisms um, and we need to uh, spur demand that way. Um, 
maybe the post that I'm still proudest of was one that essentially just tried to give a taxonomy of all those different points of view. Uh, you were in there. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, you yes. were in there. Um, and to show that, look, uh, there are probably some ideas that combine um, the uh, that combine the preferences of both camps. Um, and in fact, the parts where you think you disagree, you probably don't. And there are ideas where, if anything, they might be able to minimize those disagreements. Um, so uh, most of the guys who said that um, you know fiscal policy needs to lead the charge weren't opposed to looser um, uh, central bank monet- uh, sorry to looser monetary policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, they usually favored it, and they favored it being even looser than it was back then. They just didn't think it would work. Um, and to uh, to the monetarist, my contention was, well, look, uh, I agree. Let's try your way. And this is this is definitely something worth pursuing. Uh, I didn't back then, and I still don't think that central banks are doing all they could. Uh, and let's have a fiscal mechanism in place as a backup, right? And that to me was, uh, was, uh, it was a proud moment for me because uh, I thought it was something that might be able to kind of transcend the debate. Uh, I was wrong about that. Uh, everybody went back to, to arguing about it quite a bit, uh, and maybe my hopes were a little too high. But I think it helped, and I also think that the debate itself was totally useful, right? It was mm-hmm. so interesting uh, for somebody who's not an economist to watch, um, but it also was important for me to see exactly how everybody uh, substantiated their arguments, you know? Yep. Um, and so anyways, I, can, I consider that progress, right? I, I'm okay. not pessimistic as far as our ability to uh, advance what we know. You know, those disagreements will always be there, but I'm an optimist about that. We can get a better understanding of how to respond to crises and of how to manage the, uh, the cycle. Oh, great. Yes, my own understanding has grown, I think, because of these debates. I mean, you know, if we talk about um, some of the the things we've learned during the crisis, I mean, I was going to talk about this, we'll do it now, the safe asset problem. Right. (laughs) Um, You know, if you'd asked me in 2008, maybe even early 2009, what's the proper measure of money, I might have said M2, which is really just retail money assets. And right. But after reading Gary Gordon's work and thinking more about this, I realized, man, there's institutional money assets. That's where the bank run was. Right. That's where you saw this big collapse in the money supply. Um, you wrote like, a paper about it with I, Josh I, Hendrickson. <laughs> I did, I did. And, but it's amazing how little I knew. You know, I thought I knew a lot more than I did. And, and going into the crisis, it was, it was humbling in some manners. That you, and there's a lot to learn. And, and these debates with the people on the fiscal side, I think I've, I've, you know, I've softened my edges a little bit. <laughs> we can talk about that later. Sure. Um, but let's, let's talk about some of these big issues back then. Um, this, I just mentioned the safe asset problem. Sure. So the idea behind the safe asset problem is there's not enough safe assets. There's this huge crisis. Risk premiums went up. Everyone wants to hold on to safety. They want treasuries. They want right. safe a- assets. And of course, there's a collapse in what we thought were safe assets. Yeah. Maybe they never were, but you know we thought they were for a while. So do you think we've ever really solved the safe asset problem? Or are we still struggling with it? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, I, I think you kind of have to split the story into two parts. Okay. Right? Uh, there is the kind of acute crisis phase, uh, which you know in the US obviously lasted uh, from roughly 2008 to maybe 2010, right around there, I would actually say it <laughs> kept mm-hmm. going right for. Um, and then in Europe, you had this kind of succession of uh, sovereign debt crises uh, that came a little bit later on that were related to what happened in the US, uh, but also had uh, some components that were uniquely theirs. Um, so uh, I think the acute uh, shortage was alleviated, right? Um, and that it was alleviated through a combination of things. You know, the, the Fed and the Treasury obviously came together in the case of the Fed, lowered interest rates to zero. Um, they started backstopping uh, loans to some financial institutions. The Treasury mm-hmm. did something similar. Uh, and of course, you had the stimulus package, which uh, involved uh, tax cuts and spending and all those things, but it also involved uh, no small amount of, uh, you know, increasing Treasury supply as well, yeah. which is just the, the flip side of that, right? right? Um, the the hard part comes afterwards, right? Is there still a chronic imbalance there between the demand for and supply of safe assets? And this gets to be a hard problem, partly because uh, on this at least, I've become less hopeful that uh, we will be able to uh, quantify its impact on the real economy, right? So I was kind of like you before where I thought, well, you know, 
our understanding of money has changed, right? It's not just the retail money that matters. Now it's this institutional money. We need a good way to uh, to measure that because how else will we know if right. uh, you know if the central bank has done enough if we can't measure what it's done? Um, the problem is that I, I think, number one, the data on that's hard. Number two, our understanding of the actual dynamic isn't perfect yet, right? It's not mm -hmm. complete. Uh, and number three, there's this kind of danger that you're going to arrive at this uh, sort of tautological understanding of what's happened. Um, so I'll give you an example. Not long ago, uh, I came across uh, the paper by um, Ricardo Caballero and uh, Manuel Farhi, right? Um, and their argument is essentially that there is still an imbalance, uh, that there is still a shortage of safe assets because real interest rates are still uh, in secular decline, right? Uh, but then you, you start to say, well, why are real interest rates in secular decline? Because there's a shortage of safe assets. In other words, as a causal or as a, a kind mm. of explanatory understanding of what's happening in the economy, I'm not sure that we can be very precise. But it's still an incredibly useful framework for understanding the economy itself. In other words, mm -hmm. um, if economists think about what they do in terms of models, I tend to think about economics in terms of uh, storytelling, but I don't mean it dismissively. I mean it uh, admiringly. In other words, these stories are useful. We need to understand what's happening. Um, but if we try to be too precise, uh, you can sort of be led astray into thinking that if we just make some certain precise tweaks that that'll fix everything. Whereas I think these forces are big uh, and amorphous and a little bit harder to understand than that. Um, so it's a good story to tell. It's one that, by the way, combines aspects of fiscal and monetary policy uh, into explaining um, the role of central banks and of fiscal policymakers and how those things are so closely intertwined in a way that I don't think we previously understood. Uh, so it's helpful in that regard. But I'm not sure that we're at the stage yet where we can say, uh, okay, the uh, uh, official sector has uh, recreated, uh, privately provided safe assets uh, to the tune of X trillion dollars, and the private sector has now created mm -hmm. uh, new assets to the tune of X or Y trillion dollars. Uh, combine those two things, and it looks like monetary and fiscal policy have done enough uh, to spur recovery, right? I, don't think we're there yet. It might be some time before we are, if we ever get there. Well, I think I agree with you. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm an advocate of nominal GDP targeting is that we can't measure money. What is appropriate money? What is money? I mean, we think we know what institutional money assets are, but as you said, it's tough to measure. And I think over time, it'll be even you know new new measurements, new forms of money will merge. And we, yeah, in terms of quantity, I think it's a very tough task ahead of us. Yeah. But the thing I, I look at is like the yield on treasuries. And like the, uh, today, the ten-year yield is one point seven percent. You know, <laughs> that, that to me screams that there's this this is, is maybe insatiable appetite still for for treasuries, right. and we're not supplying enough. Um, that one way to solve it would be to supply more treasuries, which it's a political non-starter, I think. Right. The other would be we well we we get more optimistic about the future. We don't want to hold as many treasuries. Yeah, you tack it from the other side. Right. Other words, and there's both, both, both things count. Right. And, and, you know, that doesn't seem to be the case. we got China about to blow up. We don't know what's going to happen there. Um, the U.S. seems to be slowing down a little bit. I'm not sure what's going to happen this year. We'll talk about that in a minute as sure. well. And then the third alternative, which I think is what central banks are groping toward, is, well, let's, let's do negative interest rates. Maybe, there, maybe you know, the safe asset has, has depressed the market clearing rate to such a degree that we got to resort to negative interest rates. Um, in fact, that was brought up recently you know, by the former president of, of the Minneapolis Fed that negative interest rates are kind of the, the uh, plan B as right. opposed to having enough safe assets provided in the first place. So, I mean, I, my, my sense is that there probably isn't enough safe assets. And I wish the private sector could provide more. I wish we could get the kind of growth that would make us more comfortable and you know, more commercial paper, whatever it is. Um, but sure. I, I don't see it happening. So. Um, it, it, and this is where I mentioned earlier, I'm a little softer on the edges about fiscal policy. I, I, I have become a little more sympathetic to the fiscal theory of the price level. Mm -hmm. um, all my listeners out there, don't, I'm still a monetary guy. <laughs> don't freak out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and, I, and in my mind, in fact, I'm writing a paper on it with a colleague from, from Western, where we, we, we kind of rebrand it as it's a, still a monetary theory, mm -hmm. but it, it recognizes the importance of the consolidated balance sheet of the federal government. And, um, and also, I mean, let's let's remember that uh, in so many cases, these forces aren't mutually exclusive, right? 
Um, and that actually uh, is an element that did surprise me about all of these uh, debates that economists were having. Um, so we obviously already talked about uh, the best way to fill a demand shortfall, but actually these conversations kind of tend to go past each other in a lot of other ways too. Um, right now there's kind of a, a debate out there about whether or not um, the prevailing forces are a supply side stagnation versus a mm. demand side secular, secular stagnation. I haven't seen that many people just say, well, look, maybe the supply side stagnation does apply to some parts of the economy. And we also have a chronic shortfall in demand mm. that's caused by other things. This to me actually seems quite possible, right? Uh, and yet, uh, when you see a lot of economists comment on this, uh, it's like, well, no, this is this is the thing we need to worry about. That you can worry about both things, right? And you can acknowledge a certain amount mm -hmm. of uncertainty. Uh, if there's anything that we should have learned from the crisis, uh, it's that our understanding of these big forces can be upturned quite quickly and really quite dramatically. So be open to all of it before you criticize somebody for missing something. Uh, acknowledge the possibility. Uh, that you might be missing something too. You know that that to me has been a little bit more surprising than the simple fact that economists have disagreed. It's the sort of unwillingness to countenance uh, other <laughs> ideas. Yeah, lack of humility on our parts. Well, we're known for that uh, as economists. By, by the way, when, when I say economists, I, I I actually also include the entire umbrella of economic commentators. Okay. You know, I mean, this yeah. isn't you know the, I'm guilty of this too, and I'm trying to be better about it. Um, and there's a big group of people out there that I think are also somewhat influential uh, in this debate. Um, like hopefully those of us on Alphaville and the guys at Real Time Economics and other mm -hmm. places. Uh, who um, you know? I include when I when I describe economists, I should be more careful. Okay. People who talk about the economy, the economics commentating game. All right. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned a few minutes ago about how do we fill demand shortfalls, and you know, both fiscal and monetary policy could play a role. Mm -hmm. I want to be more specific. Let's talk about QE, quantitative easing, the Fed's yes. large scale asset purchase program. And um, <clears throat> you know, what have we learned about that? I mean, is, does it make a difference? Is, does it put a floor under the economy? Did, did it really buoy you know, growth, or are we skeptical that it did much? Uh, I'm not. I think it's uh, it's generally a force for good. Mm -hmm. um, have we? What have we learned about it? That's a tough question to answer because, frankly. Um, we just left it behind uh, not long ago, you know? Yep. Um, and uh, I think it's really hard to measure the impact of these things. And I, I've read some of the, the competing papers, some of which say uh, that it didn't help at all. Some say that it actively was harmful, uh, and that's these neo fisherian guys, and mm -hmm. I don't believe that for a second. Uh, and some say that uh, it did help uh, right away, and it was useful, and you could see it in terms of the immediate response and inflation expectations. And some people saying that it helps, but with a really long lag, right? I look at across these things, and I think, man, this is really hard to tell. And so. Uh, when that happens, when there's this level of disagreement, uh, I usually fall back on a, a, a different kind of maneuver than just sort of blindly accepting one or the other paper or playing a game of uh, my guy's right, your guy's wrong, which is that I, I first start by looking for the plausible mechanisms involved. In other words, um, don't point to like these fancy equations that you've done. I'm not saying that they're useless. I'm just saying I might not be able to understand them. Tell me in the real world how it works, right? Mm -hmm. So I can buy a story that says uh, that QE works by uh, taking duration risk out of the market, by the portfolio rebalancing effect, um, by the expectations effect. I can buy it. They might not be right or wrong, but I can buy it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't quite buy the argument. Uh, that QE uh, is a deflationary pressure because I don't see how in the real world that would happen, right? I could be totally missing something, but I'm still waiting for somebody to, to show me how that would work. And I don't think the neo fisherian guys, the, the neo, I don't know, <laughs> the, no, that, that's, <laughs> whatever, yeah, they haven't right. done it, right? right. So uh, as far as what we've learned, um, uh, I think we've learned, if anything, uh, that there, that the widespread skepticism of it suggests uh, that the central bank uh, didn't do a good enough job of explaining it, number one. So there's probably a communications yeah. problem there. Uh, number two, it's probably not a first best mechanism because it is still another way in which central banks try to influence the decisions of um, 
of private actors, of the banks, the financial institutions, uh, and you know, and companies that borrow money and all these things, but can't actually alter those dis- or uh, affect those decisions directly, right? So um, you know, it is a, a kind of um, it is a kind of workaround, right? Whereas something like NGDP targeting backed by a fiscal mechanism, right, is a direct, mm-hmm. uh, is a, something that directly affects uh, what people do and what people have and what they can spend, right? So uh, that's one thing. Another thing is that there are still a lot of unknowns about QE that we're probably not going to solve anytime soon. So one is its impact on financial markets, and I don't discount this possibility. Uh, so it's essentially a safe asset swap, right? You, right. you take out... Um, you take bonds out and you essentially credit the banks with reserves. Those reserves can't be rehypothecated to the same extent right. uh, that the bonds can. That probably does have at least some effect, right? Mm-hmm. It might not be big, but it probably has some effect um, on the sort of, you know, the kind of lending paths that, that get carved through the uh, shadow banking system. Uh, another one is uh, that it might, at least at first, lead to a little bit more uh, inequality because it affects asset prices and the people who have assets tend to be richer than the people who don't have assets. (laughs) That's just a a straightforward thing. Uh, I have some reason to doubt that uh, bit of skepticism, uh, in part because of some findings by the economist Ed Wolf. Um, And uh, what he said essentially is that because uh, the middle class was so highly levered to asset price, uh, to house prices, right? The recovery in house prices, right, has affected them, uh, you know, proportionally uh, a lot more than it would affect, um, you know, rich people who, hmm. you know, have a couple of houses, but they mm-hmm. tend to be mostly paid off and they're just not highly levered. Okay. Rich people, of course, have uh, more assets in terms of like equities and things like sure. that, um, to which they're still probably not all that levered. So there's a closer to a one-to-one relationship there. Whereas for the middle class, which was damaged so, you know, in such mm-hmm. a devastating fashion by uh, the financial crisis, um, that's going to increase their their wealth proportionally. Again, this isn't you know, it's a palliative fix mm-hmm. or anything. Uh, proportionally, it's going, to, it's going to affect them a little bit more. So I'm not sure about the inequality ar- uh, argument. Um, but, you know, that, the idea that it, it sends... Uh, it sends money uh, into emerging markets um, that then when it gets taken out of emerging markets at the end of QE, there's this big whiplash effect, right? I, I get it. And, and I think these these are all, again, plausible stories. Do they uh, overcome or are they enough to um, overwhelm the benefits of QE? I really don't think so, right? So I, I myself uh, thought that the Fed stopped doing QE too early. Um, just like I thought they raised rates too early. Um, I think when people talk about the Fed's arsenal, right, maybe doing more wouldn't work, but we don't know because they didn't do more uh, and they could have. I think one of the the uh, challenges when someone does critique QE, and I have my own critiques of it, is you got to know the counterfactual. What would have happened in the absence of QE? Um, if, assuming no other tools were tried. And so, I, you know, I, I, I do think... My own view is it put a floor on the economy. In the absence of that, things could have been a lot worse. So even in the case where there's inequality because of QE, well, I would take a little more, a little inequality as opposed to unemployment at 10% again or sure. you know, something greater than that. So it's, it's, you know, when you, you have to pick between two bad choices, pick the one that's the least bad, and that might be the one we had. That one had to drive, uh, drive you guys especially nuts, right? <laughs> I know it's the, the idea that you just don't know what would have happened in its absence is like the kind of curse of economists. I guess of social scientists in general, well, it, but it especially is. of economists, but macroeconomists it, no, it's, in particular. It, it's a, but I think it's a good point because we just don't know. I mean, I think I, I have a vision of what would have happened, but you know, I can't prove it unequivocally. Um, but my, my own view kind of evolved. I, I've been a cheerleader, as you know, for QE. Um, I'd like to have it done in a more predictable, rules-based manner. I'd like it to be more data depend, not time. Like QE2, QE2 was, you know, we're going to finish up and you know, in 2000, what was it, 10? Right. You know, that, I think that was a horrible idea. Um, but start, I think it might have started in 2010 and then uh, 2011. twist in 2011. 11, yeah. yeah. But QE, so I thought QE3 was even better because it was based upon, you know, certain outcomes. But but even then, all these were very ad hoc. They changed, you know, for, the Ford guidance was, was kind of make up as we go along. So I think they could have done a better job. But my big skepticism, looking back, is at the end of the day, I think the Fed doesn't want more than the one and a half to two percent inflation generated, no matter what it does. 
So, um, and I, I wrote this on you know on your blog this this past week, but. You know, I may be wrong. Some have argued we have low inflation because the Fed is just not powerful enough. Mm -hmm. I think after seven years of averaging 1.5% core PCE inflation, this is a revealed preference. The Fed may not even be doing this consciously, but they're, they're content. They're not going to try harder because they got to prove their inflation fighting credibility. But if it is the case that the Fed's happy with this, and that's a big debatable point, but if it's, that's the case, then I think QE generated what it was going to generate, which is this slow, sluggish growth. And in other words, they never could have done something really radical because they never wanted to get past that one and a half. I mean, Ben Bernanke wrote, a, if you may recall, uh, one of the senators sent him a letter, why don't you try 3% inflation? And he goes, no, 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 we can't do it. We don't want to jeopardize our inflation fighting credibility. It would be too radical of a change. Uh, in my view, you, you, we needed probably 3 4% inflation soon after the, the crisis to get total spending back on path. It'd be temporary. We still have long run inflation to be anchored. But that, in my mind, I guess that was never going to happen. So QE, I guess my, my point is this QE, given the Fed's commitment to low inflation, was never going to do that much. Um, and, and I think that's a problem everywhere in the world. Uh, so what do you think about that argument? Yeah, you, you could well be right. Um, uh, you know, it's it's hard to know what's in the mind of a central banker, right? right? Um, and so they've at least made the right right noises about two percent being um, being a, a kind of uh, an average rather than being a ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, it being a kind of a target around which it can fluctuate, and they would tolerate it. Um, we don't know because they didn't get there, but. Uh, there was a, a recent uh, paper by Olivier Blanchard that I think you can maybe connect to this a little bit. Uh, and I, I think his, his basic point was that uh, inflation expectations were so well anchored, mm. right, that it became really hard to de-sticky um, those expectations. And so in the aftermath of the crisis, we should have had some fairly powerful deflation. We didn't. We had very low but positive mm -hmm. inflation, right? And I remember in 2010, I came across an IMF paper that found that this had actually applied to a lot of other economies as well. Uh, in other words, that um, when you had these crises, uh, inflation would certainly drop. There were strong disinflationary trends, mm -hmm. but that then they would start to kind of even out close to zero uh, without necessarily tipping into deflation. Um, and so Blanchard's point was that um, it might have stopped the Fed from being more aggressive in the early phase of the crisis, hmm. right? Because they didn't see the deflation, right? In other yeah. words, if, if the Fed had seen that inflation had fallen to negative 1.5% or whatever, they might have uh, expanded their balance sheet early on to the place where we are now, three, three point something uh, you know, mm -hmm. trillion dollars. Um, whereas before, you know, they did it in, like you said, this ad hoc manner where they had Q1, Okay, well, that wasn't enough. So a little later, right. we had Q2. And then, wait a minute, that didn't work. Let's try this twisting. And then we have Q3. Like, it's, imagine if instead the <laughs> Fed right away had said, man, we're going to expand our balance sheet right now to $4 trillion and get this over with, right? Maybe they thought they couldn't because inflation was still positive And they thought, well, God, if we expand the balance sheet to $4 trillion right. now, we're going to have 10% inflation. Because if it's at 1% now, despite how terrible the economy is, imagine what will happen later. But it turns out that because those expectations are so well anchored, uh, they weren't as aggressive then. Um, and it might also mean uh, that we might be kind of missing something about how aggressive they are now. In other words, we don't know the point at which those expectations become unanchored, right? Uh, it also means though that we, we, as we're learning, we had more running room than we thought, that we could have been more aggressive <clears throat> uh, and we just haven't gotten back to 2%. And then because of uh, what happened with uh, oil, um, you know, headline inflation has been, uh, you know, hovering between zero and 1% right. for a while. Uh, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, I think uh, it's just too bad. In other words, it, my my main criticism of the Fed, acknowledging some of the great things they did in the aftermath of the uh, or it, during the immediate stages of the crisis, mm -hmm. um, was that they didn't do all this stuff at once. Uh, instead of sort of doing it over time and very gradually, uh, I think that's really too bad. Yeah, looking back, you it, it seems you can make a case that man, you you spent all this political capital on these experiments, QE one, QE two, QE three. 
you know, this is Monday morning quarterbacking. Why not just go back and use it all up in one fell swoop and, yeah. and, and be done with it? But, of yeah. course, that's easy for us to say of here. Of course it is. Yeah, 2016. Of it is. I'm glad I'm not, I wasn't sitting at, at that conference table right, you know, when they were right. discussing this. You know, that's a tough job. No, absolutely. Well, since we're on this topic of inflation, mm-hmm. you know, I've written on this, and I, I think someone, maybe you've written on it too, or acknowledged it. Rhino Ryan Avent at The Economist says as well, um, Matt Iglesias, do you think the Fed has an asymmetric inflation target? I mean, we've kind of touched on this, but do you think that they are, you know, again, if you look at core PCE inflation, it, it seems to be they're not, they're treating 2% as a ceiling as opposed to a, right. a target where, you know, on average you hit a little bit above 2%, a little below, and and, and, and on average it'd be 2%, but on average it's closer to between 1% and 2 So what, what do you think is right. going on there? Uh, unfortunately, I think that is uh, something that we can reasonably assume to be the case, that it is an asymmetric target, that it uh, that it is closer to a ceiling, again, without being able to read minds. Uh, but I think we've gotten to the point now where we'd actually have to see inflation be above 2% and maybe even mm-hmm. considerably above 2% for a sustained period of time, maybe a year or two or whatever, um, uh, to overturn that assumption. In other words, right now, I think that's actually a fair thing to guess. Uh, that's too bad. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and I think it means uh, that we are slowing down the recovery um, you know, before we really have to. I think there's an exception to that, by the way, which is that I do think that if we were to get an unexpectedly sharp recovery in oil and commodities prices, and if those are the things that were primarily responsible for driving headline inflation mm-hmm. above 2% for a while, I think they would be willing to look away from that. In other words, if core inflation is flat throughout that period, Mm -hmm. they'd probably say, yeah, it's fine. And in fact, we saw something like that, uh, I believe in, uh, was it 2010 or 11, or maybe maybe in 2012, 2011, right, right around right. there. We saw it, we saw headline inflation go above 2% for a little while. And I think it even got close to 3%. Um, and they didn't do anything, uh, partly because the labor market was still in such bad shape. Uh, and also partly because it was sort of obvious that there were these weird fluctuations in commodities mm-hmm. and in food prices and things like that, uh, that would probably go back to being below 2%. Uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I will add one more thing about oil, which uh, I think goes against the kind of prevailing wisdom of what's happened now. I think that what happened uh, in the oil market essentially prevented the Fed from tightening uh, I- a year before it actually did end up tightening, hmm. right? So uh, if you look at um, where inflation was back then, right, which is I think it was about 1.5%, not 2%, but Uh, you look at where the labor market was back then, right? I think it's fair to guess that the Fed would have been pretty close to tightening a year earlier, right? Because think about this, um, you know, the labor market was at pretty close to the Fed's estimate of, uh, you know, of full employment Mm -hmm. when they ended up tightening. And yet inflation was off by like 1.7 percentage points, right? Mm Because remember that the Fed's goal is headline inflation and uses core as a guide, but its goal is to you know control mm-hmm. headline inflation. Um, so it was missing by a ton on inflation, but the labor market was pretty close to, to its estimate of full employment. A year earlier, you would have had both inflation and the labor market pretty close to the goal. In other words, not close enough uh, to think, well, that's, you know, that's fine. We don't have to you know, think about this mm-hmm. anymore. But close enough, I think, that the Fed would have decided, well, now is an appropriate time to raise interest rates, at least the first time to try it. So I actually think that the big decline in oil, right? I'm totally speculating here. I do that sometimes. I'm guessing. I think that the big decline in oil probably uh, gave us an extra year of interest rates at 0%. Uh, maybe that had an impact on the labor market last year, and maybe not. These things are tough okay. to you know, disentangle. Uh, but I think it had a positive effect. So all these people saying, well, the decline in oil was too fast, too soon, uh, you know, it's it's uh, turned the conventional wisdom on its head. I think all that's actually kind of nonsense, right? I mm-hmm. think that's a sort of immediate uh, – it's an immediate panicked reaction. I don't buy it. Uh, but the better story, I think, is that what happened in oil markets, which I do think was largely driven by these innovations uh, that have been made by the frackers, right? I think that gave us a whole extra year uh, of interest rates at zero, and I'm grateful for that. <laughs> so you don't um, – have you seen Bernanke's post where he, he, he speculates or he estimates um, how much of the decline in oil since 2014 – when it starts to go down sharply, 
is due to supply versus demand. Okay. And what does he say? It's demand. He well, about half of it. Yeah. He, okay. He says about forty to forty-five percent. And and based on James James Hamilton had something similar. And I actually did my own little calculation. Uh, and you also thought it was mostly demand. Well, I, about the same number. I, I got about fifty percent. But sure. but so th- hey, that's pretty good though. <laughs> yes. Well, no. I mean, it, it, I think it's you can't debate that supply of oil has. I mean, it's 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 un deniable that oil's been surging. The question is, has the global economy slowed down some and pulled a drag on the prices as well? Oh, probably, yeah. yeah. But by the way, half and you know, if, if you take the, you know, the, the decline, uh, where did oil peak at north of 110, 115, <laughs> down to 30, you know, if half of that drop is from supply side factors, that's impressive. But I, I think there's a more subtle story happening here uh, than just oil is in a glut and that's what caused the decline. It's actually the ability of frackers to come online quickly mm-hmm. when prices return, right? That has kept the uh, price of oil I see. the anticipation, depressed, right? Yeah, because uh, if you think about it, you know, it would be one thing um, if oil were still an extractive market that um, everywhere, uh, where it required huge upfront costs uh, mm-hmm. to get it out of the ground every single time, and then you have a big price decline, and all these guys go out of business, all the producers go out of business, and to crank the machinery up again mm-hmm. would be really expensive, right? Fracking's a little different. Um, the the phrase that I saw, and I forget who was initially responsible for it, was that it's closer to a, a manufacturing business model, and he referred to it as manufacturing, huh. right? Which is that yeah. when the prices make sense, you can just get things moving again, right? Um, and I think so the combination of higher actual supply in real time, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, the acknowledgement um, that these productivity gains have been made uh, in the you know production of oil uh, and oil products, uh, I think, is largely responsible for uh, for the decline. And of course, there are some demand side things happening here too. You can't deny that, right? It's sort of, it would be silly to to ignore that. Um, but I, I think it's a, I think that is uh, in general a positive story. Uh, and oh, even, absolutely. You know, it's a, a, we, we like positive supply shocks. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. But so what you're saying though, just to recap, is is the understanding that these frackers can instantly or quickly come back online, which means prices will remain depressed. And just the anticipation of that is helping keeping them almost permanently lower to some extent. Yeah, uh, I, and I would, uh, I would, I guess, go to the second derivative then. It's not that it'll keep them depressed in absolute terms, but if there was going to be a recovery, then maybe the slope of the recovery of would be a little bit more okay. shallow. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's one more thing on the demand side of oil's decline. Mm-hmm. So, you know, let's just say it is 50%, which may be- Sure, maybe, I, I can buy that. Which maybe it's not, maybe it's less, but let's say it's 50%. I see an irony in this because the Fed has been saying, one of the reasons it's been saying that it doesn't want to act is it, it looks at inflation, inflation is low. Well, why don't you do something? Well, because it's, it's oil. Oil has, it's a transitory thing. It's going to, at some point, oil is going to pull back, it's going to go back up. But if half of that decline, this transitory factor is due to weak global demand, I mean, they're barking up the wrong tree here, right? They're, I mean, that should be cause for concern. If if oil is low because of demand, not supply, then they should be even more worried about it as opposed to, well, we can lay off, you know, not do anything until it returns to no- a normal path. Yeah, it, it's a signal, in other words. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's also just, uh, I think, further recognition. Um, that when you look at inflation, you shouldn't just look at you know the the headline or the core number. You should also look at its individual components. Um, you know how much is oil versus housing, oh, I, um, absolutely things of that nature. Like I I, I think uh, you know this stuff is complicated. This stuff is hard to understand. You know, um, well, doesn't this raise questions about how robust inflation targeting is? I mean, you know, you know yeah. where I'm coming going with this. I mean. These supply shocks. I mean, you mentioned the Fed did not move in 2011, but we know who did the ECB. Yeah, I mean, they, they, well, they moved the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, they did. They they took. In my my reading of it is they 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 saw the same signals the Fed did, but they were the Fed realized it was more commodity based. The ECBs are like, you know, no, we're going to jack up rates and in second stage of that that crisis. So, uh, to me, you know, in real time, it's hard to know. I, I guess I want to be fair to the Fed to the ECB. In real time, it's sometimes hard to discern what's what's causing this. Is it demand? Is it supply? And to me, that's should beg the question: Well, maybe inflation targeting isn't the most robust way to do monetary policy. But I want to beat that because everyone knows my views on that already. <laughs> yeah, I mean uh, the, the the role of the uh, the I, I 
I really genuinely am not sure um, what plausible justification Trichet could give now for having raised interest rates in 2011. Um, there were other things happening in Europe, though, that I, I think were just uh, setting the stage for a more protracted downturn there. And I mean, I think, you know, I think Europe at this point is closing in on a lost decade. I saw somebody Absolutely. point this out the other day. Um, but but the, another part of what was happening then that should have influenced monetary policy was that uh, over the last few years, um, you had some countries uh, in the eurozone who were uh, running big current account surpluses, right? Then you had the countries uh, in the periphery who, before the, mm -hmm. their own crises, had uh, current account deficits, right? Um, now, those countries in the periphery, right, rather than uh, you know spending money uh, to juice demand, or rather than having a central bank that was doing enough to juice demand, essentially uh, became more competitive um, by by letting letting demand fall off a cliff, uh, and then letting you know mm -hmm. the sort of wages collapse um, and the prices of other things collapse, uh, and then of course you had um, uh, you had a situation where they were brought back up into uh, a current account balance that was roughly flat, right? So you had countries uh, that had been doing fine, and especially Germany, um, running current account surpluses and kept its surplus, right? And then you had the countries before uh, that were running current account deficits that stopped importing stuff because demand had fallen apart, mm -hmm. right? Getting into a current account balance and the Eurozone as a whole was then running a huge surplus. That puts a lot of upward pressure on the Euro, right? Mm -hmm. At precisely the time when what you want is a weaker Euro. Uh, and it wasn't offset by uh, central bank action. And um, what you ended up with was long protracted Disaster. recessions in, <laughs> yes. yeah long protracted uh mm -hmm. downturns um you know in some of these countries uh, and it's really too bad uh, although I, I think it seems like mario draghi has just about succeeded in uh you know stemming the worst of that uh and and in moving them back towards something that resembles recovery um, but as far as Europe goes, that's I'm sort of got the opposite view uh, as I do, I guess, with the U.S., where with Europe, I'm kind of near-term hopeful uh, and long-term pessimistic because okay. the design flaws there yeah. of uh, you know, a fiscal and monetary sure. you know, union just don't, don't quite work. I'm actually – I finished a paper up. It'll be out soon at the Mercatus Center on, on the uh, Eurozone. It looks at the role that ECB played. Um, but I think – you know, so I, I, I point out the fact that the ECB rose rates in 2008, and the Fed didn't. It rose rates in 2011, and it signaled it wanted to tighten, that that played a huge role. But I think you could step back and more fundamentally say, look, the real cause of the of the crisis was it was this is a design a flaw in the design of the currency union itself, right? It, it's it's almost inevitable a crisis was going to break out when you got countries like Germany and Greece, you know, in the same currency, and you don't have that flexibility that yeah. they had before, so. Um, That's a tough story. By the way, I do want to acknowledge that the institutional and political constraints on the ECB, um, and to some extent, I think on the Bank of Japan, uh, are a little bit trickier and more severe than even the ones on the Fed, mm -hmm. right? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, I, and and to be fair, uh, I think Draghi has probably done all he can within those constraints. I've actually mm -hmm. been quite impressed by him, and he's also for a while. Was the uh, he was like the one high profile policymaker arguing that demand recovery is what was needed, uh, and that it wasn't all structural reforms, right? I mean, he, right. He's a big believer in structural reforms, uh, but at least he was you know singing the right tune on demand. So you already answered the next question I was okay. going to have, and that's you know long term future of the eurozone. I mean, do you foresee at some point it, it breaks up, or maybe you have two currencies within the I, EU project? I, I don't know, uh, partly because. Uh, the fact that we've uh, we've still got a eurozone to this point is impressive to it me. It is, you know? yeah, it is. Uh, so I'm I'm really loath to make uh, any hardened predictions on that. I, I do think that it's kind of inevitable um, that we will at least come across a situation that's similar to the one that we had a few years ago. Uh, it just I, I don't know any way around it. I know that uh, you know. A lot of uh, a lot of people think that having a closer banking union, mm -hmm. um, that having reactive mechanisms that kick in a little bit more quickly uh, would be helpful as well, and maybe those would be enough. But I let me put it this way: I think we'll eventually find out. <laughs> okay. Now I, will, I have a lot more I could talk about on the business sure. cycle stuff, but I, I do want to switch gears to the last few minutes we have together because sure. you've done a lot of work on 
um, future of growth, secular stagnation, future of innovation. Robert Gordon had a book that just came out. Larry Summers has been talking about secular stagnation. So, I mean, there's several issues here, but I guess one is, you know, are we truly in a secular stagnant environment? Have we lost innovation? Your productivity numbers seem to indicate that, but it could be poor measurement, or maybe it could be the real thing. I mean, Coach Lakota has argued, others beside him, that we would actually have more productivity growth where the demand gap filled. It's endogenous. So th- I'm throwing several yeah. things at you no, here. No, I, I think I, I kind of know what you're getting at, though. Uh, you know, in, in the paper that Larry Summers wrote that repopularized the idea of secular mm-hmm. stagnation, which I think he wrote at the end of uh, 2013 or 2014, I can't remember, right? There was a, a line or two in there in which he referred to a reverse says law, right? Hmm. Um, and you know, says law being the idea uh, that uh, supply generates its own demand, right? Mm-hmm. And what Summers was saying was that a shortfall in demand, right, leads to uh, a weakening of potential supply, right? In other words, if you don't fill the demand shortfall now, mm-hmm. right, nobody's going to, uh, you know, nobody's going to invest enough money uh, for the kinds of innovations and projects that you need for longer term right. growth. Um, and then my colleague Martin Wolf, uh, in a recent, um, I don't know if it was in a recent column uh, or if he just told it to me uh, when I interviewed him myself for our podcast, uh, said that he would take it one step further, that uh, a demand shortfall leads to reduced potential supply, right? But that reduced potential supply also feeds back into hmm. a demand shortfall because nobody, you know, because that's what investment is, right? In other words, more investment plugs the gap, right? In mm-hmm. addition to creating potential supply, it plugs the immediate uh, you know, demand shortfall, right? And so it's kind of this self-fulfilling circle, uh, and it's a real problem. Um, I, I don't know if anybody ha- has studied this systematically. I'm not sure how you would do that, but that is uh, a compelling uh, thesis, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why I think you know, in a crisis, uh, you try whatever has a high probability of working, right? Uh, if fiscal and monetary policy aren't as coordinated as they would be in a helicopter drop, um, you know, then I think you need to use both, right? And you need to fire at the thing with both barrels, you know. And there might be some problems with that left over, but the distortions caused by the try everything approach are probably easier to deal with than mass unemployment, a huge demand shortfall shrinking potential supply that's going to be hard to increase mm-hmm. again later. Mm-hmm. So do what you can on both sides. Okay. Um, the the uh, thesis that uh, Gordon advances in his book is a, a different one, right? So right. I, I haven't actually read the book, but I feel like I've, I've read so many different arguments about the book that I can at least comment <laughs> a little bit on it. Okay. Um, in terms of the impact of uh, you know innovation and, and things of that nature, I think we always just extrapolate from the recent past, right? And I think Gordon's still doing that, um, which is the problem that I have with uh, you know the idea that yeah. we're stuck in this for another quarter century or whatever it is that that he thinks we're stuck with. Um, you know, if you had uh, if you had seen in 1996 some of the papers that were coming out about productivity, people were citing. Uh, the same kind of uh, what's it called the uh, the solo paradox, right? Mm-hmm. That uh, you can see productivity growth everywhere uh, except in, in the, the except in the measurements, right? right? Except in the numbers, right? Um, the computer age everywhere except in the productivity statistics, something like that. Um, so, anyways, you would have seen a lot of people commenting on that. You would have lot of, seen a lot of people saying, "Well, yeah, this." Uh, this computer age thing looks promising, but actually it's probably not that big a deal. And what happened after that? Well, we had eight or nine years of right. really high uh, you know, productivity growth. What's funny is that if you read the papers uh, in 2004, there's one by the New York Fed, and there's even one by Robert Gordon himself, I think, uh, in 2003 or 2004, um, extrapolating from that and saying that, well, actually, uh, some of these productivity gains are here to stay. Right before productivity <laughs> fell off a cliff, interesting. You know, so I, in the short run, we tend to extrapolate from uh, the very recent mm-hmm. past, and I think that's always dangerous. Um, uh, here's the, the the way that I I think about this, though. There was a great debate at the last uh, AEA meetings about Gordon's book, um, where there were uh, I'm simplifying here, but there were two camps essentially. Uh, one saying, well, hang on a minute, um, institutions help, and if institutions can help, right? 
then we shouldn't be so pessimistic about the possibility that we can spur innovation. We just have to make the right institutional changes, whether that's you know fiscal investment, uh, whether or not that's uh, you know I don't know concessional financing or whatever industrial policy. Mm-hmm. I don't know what you want to call it, right? Um, or getting rid of uh, a lot of barriers to to innovation, whether that's you know I don't know taxes. Um, or regulatory burdens, whatever. You can make changes. You can do something about it, right? The other camp uh, saying, well, uh, actually, this is a more mysterious process, right? That, that uh, you know, it's not necessarily an institutional thing. And even if his institutions help, it takes a little while for these gains hmm. to, you know, to materialize. And we don't actually know exactly how long it's going to take. So, Maybe I'm right about this, and we are going to have uh, you know a weaker thing. To me, the second one just kind of proves the first in a way, which is to say that uh, if it is a mysterious process, right, then why be pessimistic? You don't know. <laughs> like actually, there. Are th- mm-hmm. I mean, we're probably not going to lose the knowledge we have. Um, so uh, you know, productivity might might be stagnant, but I don't think we're going to become less productive in most sectors, right? Uh, but at some point, you know, I think you could see the gains accelerating. You know, but. You know, the, my 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 real overarching take on all this is to say that we actually have a very limited sample size of experiments to deal with here. We're only going back to the Industrial Revolution, which some mm-hmm. people think sounds like a long time because it's two hundred and something years, whereas to me, uh, that's nothing, right? I mean, humans have been recognizably human for like fifty thousand years. Okay, so uh, it's not clear to me that we know that much about it. I don't think we have a great theory yet, um, and I think most economists would admit this about uh, total factor productivity, which is, I think, the best measurement we have mm-hmm. for you know, to represent innovative innovation, that part of, of productivity growth. Um, so, anyways, uh, massive radical uncertainty about this topic. Uh, that's not just me. That's also what I think everybody else should embrace. Okay. Well, you you are though kind of a technical optimist, though. I, I sense from your writings, you think things are getting better in terms of smart car technology. And oh, stuff, I think and automation. A, yeah. yeah, I I am too. In but general. I'll, in yeah. general. In general. Right. Right. <laughs> well, on that note, we have to end. We're out of time. But Cardiff, it's uh, been a pleasure having you on the show. Um, thanks so much for coming to join us. Our guest today has been Cardiff Garcia of the Financial Times. Thank you. My pleasure. This was awesome. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.